y'all. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for asking. It's me, Kim, and I'm back for another live video. I know y'all didn't think we weren't going to do no more lives. <laughs> um, I love live videos. I just think they're, they're fun, and I like the interaction. And I wanted to do a live video, one, because I just got my hair done. <laughs> You know what? I said this on Patreon last night. You know how like right after you get your hair done, you just want to be out. You go to the grocery store, you go to the furniture store, you go to Ross, you go to Target, you visit your family. <laughs> That's been me today. Just, you know, you just want to be seen. Um, but also, no, seriously, <laughs> seriously. Um, I do have a lot of thoughts about this situation with both them, Jean. Um, and Amber Geiger, and especially what happened at the sentencing hearing yesterday. And I worked out a lot of my initial thoughts over on Patreon last night, but I just, I couldn't let it go and I have more thoughts. And I do think that I have some unpopular opinions about this. And I don't revel in having unpopular opinions. I'm not one of those people, okay? I'm not one of those like stupid, like comedy bros. It's like, come at me. Like, no, that's not me. Um, but I'm also not afraid to have an unpopular opinion. I know that I can be wrong. I'm open to correction. So I just thought it would be interesting to come on here, have this conversation, and then maybe we can talk about it. And maybe I'll come away from this thinking differently, feeling differently. Um, yeah, you know, I don't revel in it and I don't run from it. So. I want to say, first of all, that um, the foundation of my politics is not rooted in a desire for vengeance. I don't have that in me. Um, I also don't feel like suffering is the truest pathway to justice. I feel like a lot of people feel like justice requires suffering. In my mind, I feel like suffering begets more suffering. And I really became very clear on this while I was reading a book called The Reckonings by Lacey M. Johnson. And in that book, Lacey just does a fantastic job of laying out what I think justice looks like and the path to get there. And so fundamentally, whenever we're talking about wrongdoing, violence, harm, my first inclination is not to, to kill either literally or figuratively. Um, empathy is my default. I've said that over and over again, even with people who I disagree with, right? So I don't fuck with the pick me's, but it is no longer my desire to like go at their throats. Um, I don't fuck with a lot of Christianity, a lot of it. I grew up very, very religious, going to church two or three times a week. Most of my family still very religious. But my first instinct is not to attack because I don't think that that's productive. I don't think that that gets us to the goal. Oh, also, new glasses. <laughs> um, second pair, you know, my Malcolm X glasses. Okay, <laughs> so I saw that, um, I saw that display that happened in the courtroom at the sentencing hearing of Amber Geiger yesterday. And I think I had a different reaction from a lot of people that I know and a lot of people whom I follow on Twitter and on Facebook. My first instinct is not to berate that child. Brant Jean is a teenager. That's an 18 year old who lost his big brother. You know, like my, my dad died when I was 19. And I say a lot that that changed my DNA, my dad's death, right? I lost him before I even really knew myself. And, but still, I knew it was coming. I can't imagine the kind of suffering, the kind of heartbreak for your perfectly well older sibling to be murdered in his own home. And I think most of us can't imagine that. And 
I am uncomfortable with certain commentary about a situation that most of us can't even fathom. Like you can't even process it in your body. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about, I'm a cultural critic. I wanna be the best cultural critic. I wanna give y'all the best commentary, the best analysis, and that requires looking at the, current, the contemporary moment, looking at history, looking at all of these different kinds of influences and references However, I think one drawback of cultural criticism is sometimes we take people, people who are complex, people whose inner lives are complicated, often contradictory, who are messy, and we turn them into symbols. So while we're trying to describe a larger social phenomena, phenomenon, that's the singular, when we're trying to describe or, or talk about structural inequality, these huge macro systems, we take a person who's going through a singular experience that we can't really even know, and we make them into a totem for our own purposes. I, I've really been trying to, to think about this, and actually this thing with Brant Jean has brought this to the fore for me that we don't look at them as a human trying to wrestle with um, a very difficult situation. We turn them into a representative. And so when we're trying to make a, a case about what's happening in white supremacy, what's happening with whiteness and white womanhood, we project all this stuff onto this person who's just trying to make it. And so, when I see the kind of nasty, um, the nastiness aimed at Brent John for what he did on the, the stand, the, the, public, the public proclamation of forgiveness that he gave to Amber Geiger, I wouldn't do it. I don't endorse that. It's not for me. But at the same time, I ain't never been there. And I pray every single day that I'm not there. And I pray every single day that nobody in my family has to be there. Um, and I just, I want to be kinder. Okay. So um, I do think that it's inappropriate at this point to like pathologize Brent Jean. I think it's weird. Um, I also think it's weird to project this idea that he is performing for whiteness. I don't know what that kid is doing, right? I understand that we cannot divorce the history of the, the horrific misdeeds of white women from what we see when we see an 18 year old child publicly professing that he forgives the murder of his brother, publicly professing that he loves her, that he wants to hug her, I get it. It looks, if you take a step back, it looks bad. But we're also bringing a whole lot of, we're bringing our shit into this, right? And I also just feel like it is possible. You know, I grew up super, super religious. And the way that I understand the super, super religious black folks in my life to think about Christianity, it's not about public performance, not entirely. It's also about an internal liberation. And maybe, and look, like I said, I don't necessarily agree with it. It's not the route that I would go. I think therapy works a little bit better for me, but there's still a little bit of that in me. Yeah, there's still a little bit, it's still there. And so I just think that consist there's, a, there's a paternalism in folks who do not understand what this kid is going through, projecting all this stuff onto him and saying, this is what you should do. You will never, you ain't never been there. But also the assumption that all of this is about a performance to appease whiteness, I don't know. I don't, 
I don't, I'm not so sure. And I also think that sometimes when we are talking about the ways that we need to reject the white gaze, um, reject these ideals of white womanhood, that sometimes we end up recentering whiteness in these conversations that are supposed to be about affirming the humanity and dignity of black folks. I think sometimes when we are putting all this stuff onto this kid who is having a singular life altering experience, it ends up being dehumanizing. When we turn somebody who was going through that type of tragedy, the, the Jean family, right? When we turn those people who are trying to navigate a tragedy in the best way that they know how, these are the tools that they have. We turn them into representatives of a white supremacist state. That's also dehumanizing to them. We are stripping them of their ability to navigate in the way that they know how. I mean, it's like I said, maybe not what I would do, maybe not what I would endorse, but I don't know. It's not for me, you know? And so we make these um, huge generalizations about white supremacy and terror and whiteness. Meanwhile, in the process, you're using these people as symbols and, and dehumanizing them. And, but that's supposed to be the antidote to the dehumanization that white supremacy causes. I, it don't work for me. I, I just, I don't see it. I don't see it. And I think, and let me just say, I think that a lot of progressive people have a disdain for Christianity. Particularly the kind of Christianity that um, is very pervasive in like, in, um, among black folks in the West. And I get it, I understand. Got my own critiques as somebody who went to church three times a week, <laughs> okay? I, I understand. But I think that some of that disdain forecloses our ability to offer grace to people who are suffering, suffering the way that we're suffering. It inhibits our ability to assess situations in a, a nuanced way that allows those people dignity. Um, what else I got? Oh, okay, so people talked about, you know, they're uncomfortable with the performance. I'm uncomfortable with it too, but I gotta say, Christianity is very performative. <laughs> um, so if you um, accept this idea of forgiveness, look, I don't believe Amber Geiger is guilty as sin. <laughs> No pun intended. Um, she did it. She, I, I do not believe in vengeance, but I do believe in consequences. Even though I've completely divested from investment in the carceral state, I don't really care about locking people up, but I do believe in consequences. So I do not believe that this is an opportunity to give that woman any kind of absolution. No, girl, you did it, right? And the, the, you know, I think that sometimes when people are talking about like the, the biblical kind of forgiveness, like God punished all kinds of people, you know, it's not like, it's not like God was just like, oh, okay, you good. <laughs> like, it's like the entire Old Testament is God punishing people, getting them the fuck out of here. <laughs> now, I, um, I, I just don't have a desire for, um, punitive punishment, but I'm not anti-punishment altogether. It's just not my first, it's just not my first thing. And also I just think like, I understand that we want to reject the idea that black folks should be expected to immediately forgive. Like I said over on Patreon last night, forced forgiveness, Coerced forgiveness is abuse. Coerced forgiveness is violence. But I, in the way that I have seen it be practiced, this kind of Christian ethic of forgiveness, it is about trying to loose yourself from those chains. People don't wanna be tied down. You know, I've seen so many people over the past day or so say, um, if, if I die, 
I don't want my family to be up there offering any kind of forgiveness. I, I want, the, and it's like, that's, a, that's cool, but you're going to be dead. If I am murdered, if I'm killed, I want my family to do whatever they need to do to keep living. Now, don't hurt yourself. Don't hurt anybody else, right? No drugs, no violence. But adopt whatever, whatever ethic, whatever code, whatever scripture you need to do to get out of bed tomorrow, you do that. I'm not going to be here. Because you know, because you know who doesn't have to bury me? Random people on the internet. You know who not going to pay my mama's bills if her life falls apart and she can't go to work no more? Random people on the internet. You know who not going to cook her meals? Um, you know who's not going to be like the best aunt in the world <laughs> to my nieces? Random folks. So it just seems to me that, that offering that kind of commentary, that kind of critique from folks who are not invested in offering any kind of meaningful support, either emotionally or financially to people who have, have suffered a life altering track, it just seems wrong to me. It seems unkind. It seems unethical, immoral. I understand disagreeing, I, I do. I just think like black folks are, are, these are people destroying people in the, the name of, of a progressive politic. I don't know. And, and I think, you know, the thing about religion, I've been super religious at different times in my life. And it's just, it just seems to me that people are looking for a way to make meaning out of their lives. Black folks in particular are looking for a way to just explain and cope with all of the unbearable shit that happens to us. And one of the most popular ways is via religion. It's via these doctrines that sound ridiculous. But we all just trying to cope. I think that in white supremacy, most of us are flailing. Most of us are just trying to keep our head above water. And we, we grasping at whatever we can grasp. And for some folks, it's that. And it's just, it's not my first instinct to say, you're embarrassing black folks. You're harming black folks. I just, I can't get, I can't get there. And the other thing is, in um, the, the critiques of the Jeans, and Brant Jean in particular, one of the reasons why I approach my politics from a place of empathy is because I realized not too long ago that it's real easy to have revolutionary words, okay? It's real easy to do what I do or to tweet it out or to Facebook it and say, this is what needs to happen. It's a lot more difficult and a lot more and a lot rarer to have revolutionary action. Yesterday, I saw somebody talking about this and, and somebody's like, why do we always forgive? And somebody under the post said, uh, we forgive because we don't want to pick up a sword. And I stopped myself, but I wanted to say, when's the last time you picked up a sword? I know a few activists. I know a few people who are 100% committed to the cause of dismantling all this shit. They down. They've sacrificed things. Most people ain't doing it. So when I see people talking all this big revolutionary shit and you still just try to make it like the rest of us just trying to make it, I have questions. I have, I have questions. And I see people and I be like, but your words are not matching up with your life. So you are expecting these folks in the middle of an unimaginable tragedy to be um, Malcolm X, but you Clarence Thomas in your personal life. Stop it. <sighs> Sorry, I just, <laughs> I just get, I'm so emotional. Okay, um, 
yeah, I'm not prioritizing. I, we're un inadvertently prioritizing the right gays. Do what you need to do. However, look, <clears throat> I have no desire to go in on Brant John, but we can talk about Tammy Kemp. That's what we can't talk about. Um, I've seen a lot of people who I respect in the legal profession say that that don't make no damn sense. Now, if this 18 year old kid wants to step down from the witness stand and compel Amber Geiger to give her life to Christ and say he loves her, that's one thing. Tammy, Judge Tammy, what you doing? I, I have never, have you ever seen that before? I've never seen that before. And I understand that maybe she got caught up in the moment, right? Maybe Brant John um, created an atmosphere where, I don't know, the spirit moved and whatever. But let's, let's be reasonable. And I just wonder, um, and you know, I will say over and over again, I'm anti-police prison and prosecution. I'm anti-most judges too, because they all complicit. But... I wonder if we went through all of Tammy Kemp's cases, has she ever come down from the bench and hugged a, a convicted murderer before? How many hugs has she given out to, to people who are acquitted in her court? Now that's when we can say, what you doing? What's going on? And it is legitimate to think about the role that white womanhood plays in those kinds of displays and with the display of the, the cop or the bailiff or whoever stroking that woman's hair. That's legit. What are you doing? This woman already got a very short sentence. Like I said on, over on Patreon, do you know what would happen to both them, Jean, if he had killed Amber Geiger? Texas has some of the most draconian murder sentences in the country. It wouldn't be no 10 years. It would be like life. It, would not, it might even be like capital punishment. Like, so anyways, I think that there are legitimate critiques. I think there are legitimate conversations, real conversations that we need to have about the ways that that um, we're 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 used to catering to um, white folks, even after their most dastardly and despicable deeds. I'm just not willing to go there with an 18 year old. And I appreciate both them's mother um, after in a press conference saying, "This shit is corrupt." <laughs> You know, y'all need to talk about this damn police corruption in Dallas. I'm glad that she did that. You know, she was like, yeah, the Jesus stuff is cool. <laughs> the Bible is cool and all. But y'all really need to address the corruption. I am. Um, I'm in awe of the type of um, self-possession that you would need. In order to speak cogently in that way, to speak, we, we say truth to power, you know, it's hard. <sighs> okay. Um, I think that the, that's all I have to say about that. Um, before I move on to questions, before we open it up, I want to say shout out to, I am really, um, you know, you get tired after you do emotional stuff. I feel a little tired now, but um, shout out to A. Marie. She has a YouTube channel where she talks about books. She shouted me out, love her so much. You know, I'm obsessed with pop culture, so <laughs> loved it. Um, go check out her channel. I am going to do a different type of um, video format where I want to answer questions, even though, you know, my shit is fucked up, but y'all be asking me questions like I know things. So I wanted to do like a video where people ask me questions. So email me um, a video or a voice note with your question if you wanna be included in a video. The videos and voice notes cannot be longer than 45 seconds. So it's gonna be 
Kimberly at forharriet.com. And that's going to be like a new type of video format. No longer than 45 seconds. That's it. Um, so let's go ahead and um, let's talk. Because I know y'all disagree. And that's cool. <laughs> let me let me pull up that. Well, let me turn down the volume here. Um, I agree that I want my family to do whatever they can to keep going, but do not go around saying Alyssa would have wanted. Uh-uh, nope, I don't want you hugging no white women who kill me. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair, right? Do whatever you need to do. Just maybe don't do it in my name. That's fair, Alyssa. I couldn't forgive someone who murdered my relative. Um, I don't know what I would do. I don't know. I, I'm just saying, you know, if we, I think you think you know, but you have no idea. I don't know what I would do. How do you feel about restorative justice versus retributive justice? Um, I do not believe in retributive violence. It's just not the way that I roll. Um, I have been thinking about this though. Um, I do think I endorse revolutionary violence in very specific contexts. I just, I, I've read enough history, I know enough history to know that sometimes people do have to die. Sometimes, rarely, <laughs> rarely. But generally that's not my first MO. Um, and I, I am much more I'm much more into the idea of restorative justice. You know, the thing about our current justice system is it really does not do enough. And I said this in my um, Why I'm an Abolitionist video over on Patreon. But the reason why our current justice system is so broken and I think um, irrevocably broken, was that the word that I wanted to use? I think that this current justice system cannot be fixed is because it does not prioritize the needs of victims. It doesn't give people the help that they need to reclaim their lives, to be restored after they've been harmed. Now we get this, you know, one of the reasons why I don't, I guess one of the reasons why I, I'm not struck by what the Jean said in the way that others do is because what happens in that courtroom doesn't restore them. They're looking for a way to be restored. They're looking for a pathway to be whole for the rest of their lives. And that's their pathway. And we all have to try to figure out our own pathways because this justice system doesn't offer it. Locking people up don't do it. It don't do it. Not a justice system that is rooted in white supremacy. <clears throat> um okay why do people say jesus was black then say the white man gave blacks the bible in order to control them um i don't i can't even answer that i don't know um as a black woman um, oh, hi, Elias. Shout out to you. The black cop stroking her hair reminded me of the mom in the bluest eye. Absolutely despicable. Um, I agree. I think that that was just so inappropriate. Y'all don't know how to act in a courtroom? What's going on? You know, I uh, usually extend a lot more grace, you know, I'm pro black woman. This is a pro black woman channel over here. But that stuff is inexcusable. Stop it. You know, you wanna talk about an inexcusable performance. It ain't right. And we ain't even talk about that, um, whatever that black cop 
that um, testified on Amber Geiger's behalf, trying to say that the murder of both them, John, was justified. Black people fucking up in Dallas. You know, I grew up outside of Dallas. I grew up in Plano. Black people fucking up. <clears throat> um, Geiger murdered John execution style. Why forgive publicly? I just feel like the whole Christian, oops. Oh, I just feel like the whole Christian forgiveness thing doesn't hold these racists accountable. I mean, they are in a courtroom and the purpose of a trial is ostensibly to hold people accountable, right? She'd already, I, I, I don't know. It's just like, I kind of just feel like, like I said, we have so few options in these fucked up systems for personal restoration, for institutional restoration. Accountabil accountability is a fucking farce. I, I just think it's more, it's just complicated. Okay. Um, Lex says the forgiveness part doesn't bother me because holding grudges suck, but the obvious coddling of this white woman was sickening. I can see that. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, we are now in a cultural moment where we're finally reckoning with the damage that white womanhood does contemporarily and historically. And when we see stuff like what happened in this trial, you can't turn away from that. You can't turn away how, you can't turn away from how white women are, um, they are encouraged to um, perpetuate these kinds of violences and then they're, they're backed up by the state. That's the thing. And that's the thing we really have to, when we are discussing this, you do have to talk about it. <clears throat> um, Christy says, I'm saddened and a bit angry about how black people are so emotionally invested in the rehabilitation of white racists of various degrees. At times, it seems not by choice. You know, I think a thing is like, yes. At the same time, so there, there are, there are all these um, cultural narratives in white supremacy about what black folks are expected to be, right? We always have to be the bigger person. We have because there are all these scripts, particularly about black women and anger and all that stuff. Um, th that's there, right? And that feeds into this narrative of you, you have to forgive, you got to move on. I, I get it. However, it's, it still strikes me as a bit paternalistic for us as outsiders to say, we know what you should do better than you know what you should do. I can say, oh, I didn't like that. That made me feel good. Oh, it felt a little icky. But I do think that sometimes we woke people, we do be approaching these conversations from an I know more than you position, a, a position of um, looking down. Condescension is the word that I'm looking for. And I don't want to do that. I don't want that to be a part of my politics. <clears throat> Let's talk about all the white people saying no one won here. They see her punishment as criminal. I don't. Anyways, you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I have not paid any attention to what any white person has said about this. 
I don't, you can't trust white people. I mean, well, I meant what I said, but you especially can't trust white people. <laughs> you especially can't trust white people in these kinds of discussions. They don't know enough. They don't have enough exposure experiences. The analysis ain't there. So, you know, I don't even be listening to white people when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, so are we just supposed to settle and deal with the way things are or actively try to get more for our people? Um, I do believe in actively trying to dismantle systems, actively trying to do things differently. Um, I do believe that. Um, however, as I said, I think most people are, it's much easier to be a revolutionary on Twitter than it is to be a revolutionary in real life. I don't know a whole lot of real life revolutionaries. And so I take a lot of commentary with a grain of salt, a grain of sand. Both of those things have grains. And I try to be as fair and empathetic as possible while also standing firm in my beliefs. I, I'm, I'm not getting up on a, on a witness stand and publicly saying I forgive my sister's murder. Today, how I'm feeling today in um, the imaginary future, Kimberly, in my mind, I don't believe I would do that. I don't think that that was the best thing to do. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel good. But like, I don't know. How many more times can I just say like, things are not black and white like that. They're just not. And like, it makes, it's uncomfortable for us to, to sit in the, the idea that like, we might not, we might not have all the answers. You know, we not sway. Yeah. Love you, Kim. Just joined Patreon. Can you offer your thoughts on violent offenders and prison abolition? Um... Yeah, so people ask me a lot about what do we do with people who per perpetrate violence if there's no prisons. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I think that there is, I think that the prison as we know it has to go. Has to go. Um, I think it perpetuates inequality. Um, I saw somebody who I deeply admire, an abolitionist I deeply admire. Her name is Derricka Purnell. She said, as long as we have this current system, there, there's no way to get equal justice for, to get justice equally for black folks and white folks. Reform is not going to get us there, right? So as long as the system exists in its current form, um, white folks ceiling for punishment is going to be black folks floor. But when it comes to what do we do with violent offenders, there's in um, the, the literature about this, there's lots of disagreements, but I do think institutionalization, but like not in the, the violent way that we imagine prisons to be. I do think that there, are, there are people who just can't live out among us, right? I don't think everybody kills just cause, um, I don't think everybody who kills can be rehabilitated they're like serial killers and serial rapists like something is wrong so i do think that i i would be okay with a different kind of institution but not the current prison system I don't know. I definitely know abolitionists who believe like no kinds of institutions. And like, we do have to reckon with like, there are people who just can't, who just can't be out. Who just can't, you, you can't live next door to them. So anyways, here's my thing though. Here's my thing. It's muddy and it's murky and we're still figuring out the answers. However, I don't believe that not having answers is a reason to not be an abolitionist. And like the classic prison abolitionist line is in the years leading up to slavery, I'm in the, in the years leading up to the end of slavery, 
There were so many, so many books and articles written about what are we gonna do when slaves are free? What are we gonna do after abolition? Our society is gonna collapse. The, the Negroes, they can't, they're not fit to live in, with the rest of us. They, they're intellectually, they're incapable. They don't have the skills. Where are they gonna live? So I don't think that not being able to 100% clearly see the future right now, I think we can get there, but not being able to 100% see the future today does not preclude me from imagining something different, from believing that we can have something different, something that is not fundamentally about imprisoning, caging, um, policing, surveilling the worst off in our society. I don't believe that we can reform our way out of that. <sighs> Thank you, Amber. I appreciate you. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to catch up with the Oh, did I? I'm trying to make sure I get all of the, um, okay, well. Her defense team was very, very good. Do we know if her lawyer, I believe you're talking about Amber Geiger, do we know if her lawyer was paid by the police Union? I know that she was off duty, but I wonder because they were so good. They seemed expensive. Oh, huh, that's a good question. You know, good lawyers are very expensive, especially defense lawyers. But you also know that white people have a lot of um, <laughs> this video going to get demonetized. We're going to say that white people, because of wealth inequality, <laughs> have a lot of uh, generational wealth that they can tap into for times like this. <clears throat> the purpose for anyone to be punished is to, is to deter others from murdering people. Um, if you read any kind of, um, any kind of research about prison, about our current prison system, arrest is not, a deterrent. Incarceration is not a deterrent for crime. In fact, incarceration leads to more crime because of the way that our prison system works. So the um, we we imprison people to deter them for committing crime. It doesn't it doesn't ring true. God commanded the Israelites to stone a man to death for gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. So these rainbowy thinking Christians are just pretentious to me. Um, well, okay. I mean, if I were really going to get into, I'm not a theologian, so I'm not even going to get into that. But I will say that the short answer for that for me would be, Old Testament theology is different from New Testament theology. Okay. Um, okay. <sighs> Do you think if it was two white families, it would more easily be a feel good story on the news and the internet? Do you think if it was two white families, it would more easily be a feel good story on the news and the internet? Um, actually, I think that the best feel good story, look, the spectacle of Brant John hugging Amber Geiger and all the black folks in that courtroom hugging Amber Geiger is a Hollywood script waiting to happen. Okay, that's the new, the blind side, that's the new green book. I, I don't think that that spectacle 
could be any more conducive to a feel good story, particularly for white folks. For black folks, we're like, oh, it looks, you know. But for white folks, you know, the people who have the money and who make the decisions, it, it don't get more touchy feely than that. So no, I don't think that it would be more of a feel good story if it was two white people. I am very good friends with the black officer that testified. He's always trying to bridge the gap between people and police officers. He actually just had a peaceful walk a few weeks ago. I can't even really say what I want to say about that because <laughs> I don't want to be rude. Um, I hope that you're not talking about the black male police officer who testified on behalf of Amber Geiger. Now look, I have friends who do stuff I don't always agree with. Oh my God. Oh, okay, I'm not even gonna go with there, but um, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I think doing good, like actually doing good is different from um, thinking, sometimes you think you, you're doing good, but you're actually not doing good. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, somebody says Norway has a great prison system. Check it out. You know, the thing about prison systems in other countries is... <sighs> We can't really, um, we cannot compare the way that prison works in the United States to the way that prison works in other countries because of the distinct racial history of the United States. Because of the foundation of policing and prison in this country, it don't work. So when you have a homogenous, a, a pretty homogenous society, like what you see in Sweden and Finland and Norway, it is much easier to have um, a less, degrading um, prison system. Because all that, that, that historic shit, it ain't tied up in it. You can't do that in the United States. It does, it, you can't. You know, that's the other thing about when we talk about, when we um, idealize the economies of those Nordic countries. The way that their inequality plays out is different because it's a bunch of white folks. You know, the social stratification in this country is, is such that black folks are purposely on the bottom. Okay, sorry. Mm. RBR Network says all these problems stem from who we elect to govern us. Reform is only as good as the people we put in charge. As I've said before um, on another video, I believe that we think that we can enter a fundamentally corrupt system and change the system. I think we have enough evidence to say that ain't how it works. That ain't how it works. The system changes you. You don't change the system. So I believe, look, I'm a voter and I've been um, purposely just ignoring this shit because I just ugh, I'm so annoyed by the political stuff. But I am plugged in because I am a voter. Voting matters. OK, because like I said, um, it can definitely get worse. We don't want shit to get worse. But this there I do believe that there are things in this society that cannot be reformed. And the prison system is one of them. <sighs> Any aspect of the current prison system that you would transfer over to a more rehabilitative victim and convict focused system? Um, I don't have an answer to that off the top of my head. My first instinct is to say no, but that's probably not true. So I'm just not gonna lie. I'm not sure, I have to think about it. 
Did the father really say he would want to be friends with her? Yes, he did say that. It's taking it a bit far. Look, it's a bit far. It's a bit far. <laughs> but um, they're, they're working through it. Thank you, Kellyanne. I appreciate you. Um, is there, how come black people always forgive racists, but won't be as forgiving to our own? I see this sentiment a lot. I'm not sure I agree, but what I will say is one of the reasons why I've had to take a step back from Christianity is I do not believe, I do not believe in doctrine, dogma, or theology that, that um, marginalizes people. I'm a, I'm a deep believer in reconciliation. And I think that there is a lot of Christian theology, you know, that old school dogma, this is there are people who can never be welcomed into the, the Christian community. I ain't fucking with it. Can't do it. Can't sit there. Can't give you my tithes. Can't do it. So I definitely think folks who are pointing out the, the hypocrisy of Christianity, the way that it's popularly practiced, that's you right. You're not wrong. Mm. <clears throat> huh. Um Okay, so one time. Oh, we're at fifty two minutes. Gosh. Okay, we'll be here for one hour. <sighs> Kim, you should study liberation and womanist theology. Um, I have. <laughs> what? <laughs> I've read um, lots of books about liberation and womanist theology. I am a James Cone stan. Um, I'm a James Cone stan. Um, I'm a Katie Cannon stan. So um, I've read a great deal of womanist and liberation theology. The problem is where I live and how those theologies are not necessarily incorporated into the church communities that would be um, most available to me. Girl, y'all out here, y'all must not know about me. I be reading, honey. Mm. Um, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Amanda. Oh, you know who else I love? Monique, Monica Coleman, a wonderful womanist theologian. Um, Kim, I saw you on a Forbes list. That's very cool. Um, I was on a Forbes list a few years ago, but thanks. <laughs> uh, somebody says, churches often act colorblind. I've attended a predominantly black church and the pastor basically wanted us to ignore being black. White churches often endorse racism views. Uh, I have never attended, you know, all of the church communities that I've ever been a part of talked about race. Um, but there's like, there's also kind of a conservative way. It, it was a, they talked about race in a very respectability politics way. Yeah. 
So it wasn't radical, but it was definitely cognizant of race and racial inequality. I've never been to no black church that just ignored race. And that's one of the reasons why I see all these, you know, black, young black people are defecting from church. Understand, understandable, right? But I also know quite a few young black people who go to these uh, non-denominational white churches. And I'm like, what type of racial teachings are you hearing in the non-denominational white churches? Okay, <laughs> I'm just saying, what is, what is Hillsong doing to address Black Lives Matter? I, I'm just, okay, sorry, we're not doing it. I'm not going into it. Um, <laughs> thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Mark. Mm. <clears throat> um, Bell says, to those saying Botham was a proud token black person, you are the lowest of the low. This is why his brother could never be your poster boy. He does not have hate in his heart. What? I don't know what that is. I have not seen any Botham Jean slander and I don't want to see it. <clears throat> Do you see, I think this will be the last one. Do you see religious, because it's allergy o'clock. That means I gotta go, girl. <laughs> Do you see religious movement as a hindrance to intellectual growth? Um, it certainly can be. I certainly think that there are, um, that there are certain kinds of church teachings that tell you that it's wrong or a sin to ask questions that if you know i remember you know i always i've always been inquisitive okay i've always been a a free thinker uh i've always been be, because i had a, a good foundation of people telling me oh you're a smart person i was just always encouraged to think about things and maybe you know think about things in a way that maybe the adults in my life didn't think i mean didn't appreciate and one of those things was church from a really young age I remember from a really young age sitting in church and questioning the idea of hell. Nobody, most people do not have, or the people in the churches that I grew up in didn't have great answers for my questions about hell. Didn't have great answers for my question about why women are inherently not fit to lead. I grew up in a church the women couldn't wear pants or it was strongly discouraged for women wearing pants. And I always just used to be like, that don't make no sense. And this is a big church too, outside of Dallas. I always used to be like, mm. but I held it in because I knew that like asking questions, people weren't down with that. So yes, I definitely think that there are church communities where people don't want you to ask questions because a lot of people think that if you ask questions, your whole belief system unravels. You know, I have been really good friends with um, pastors, maybe more than friends. <laughs> okay, moving on, moving on. Um, deacons, preachers. And we've had really deep conversations about how they have said maybe their their beliefs maybe don't align with the stuff that they preach in the pulpit because opening up those wormholes poking poking into people's deeply held beliefs it can fuck up their whole lives so i definitely think that church can be a hindrance to intellectual growth I do think that finding the right faith communities helps. Finding the right progressive minded people helps. Um, but you know, it's hard. You gotta be intentional. Okay, I am stuffed up. I gotta go, girl. Thank you guys so much for um, tuning in. I just had stuff that I wanted to say. I appreciate you enormously. Like this video. Um, I'll see you next time. Next video isn't going to be live, okay? Okay, I'm back to recording. Thank you, guys. Oh, I can't. I have to turn this off. Bye.